Hello everybody, happy Thanksgiving to you. And today is a special Thanksgiving episode of Real Music. And on today's show, I've got the talented guitarist and vocalist. Uh, he's in a band called Monkey Beat. He's a guitarist for George Thorogood and the Destroyers. And he's got a new album out called Texas Scratch with some talented guitarists in their own right, uh, Buddy Whittington and Vince Converse, very talented guitar players and uh, a great album. I checked it out and you need to check it out too. Very enjoyable to listen to some cool tunes. It will make you smile, especially if you love blues and a lot of cool guitar licks. But here we go. Here he is. Here's Jim Suler. Now tell me about this new album now. Now, am I reading right? It took 14 years to be really, I mean, I'm thinking 14 years is a long time. You know, a lot of things happen between when it's recorded and now. So why 14 years and why did you decide, hey, we got to release this thing now? Well, it wasn't my decision. Uh, this group was sort of put together by some folks. Uh, a guy a guy in New York sort of orchestrated that. And uh, we did it on their dime. And the I think whoever had the money i think after the record was completed something fell through and it, it just languished in limbo for all this time and it was really i had no control over it It wasn't anybody in the groups uh it was out of our hands yeah so once th these guys got all that sorted out we finally got the album together awesome yeah so um I don't. Yeah, I wish I because everybody asked me that. I don't. I don't really have an answer other than I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but all you know is here it is. But right, uh, right. At least it's out. At least uh, I mean, some some things are worth the wait, right? Wouldn't you say that this is worth the wait? Tell me about the guys you recorded with and how y'all got together for this. Well, I, I knew both these guys already. And as I said, this was sort of orchestrated by a guy in New York named Arnie Goodman. And uh, so we all convened in New Jersey because that's where Texas guitar players go to make an album. Okay. <laughs> Makes sense, uh, I guess. Right. Um, <laughs> that, that's where they wanted to do everything. So uh, off we went. And, um, you know, we all came in with our own material and we basically learned everything in the studio and recorded it. We did, you know, that was that was the pre-production was doing it all there. So, um, yeah, but I had known Vince from the early 90s. You know, when he, he was from Houston and I used to go down there and play in southeast Texas a lot. I'm from Dallas. And so I knew Vince from you know, from that era. And of course, Buddy Whittington's from Fort Worth, which is 35 miles away from me. I live in Dallas, as I said. So yeah, I mean, our paths had crossed, but um, that's, how, that's how this effort came. It's collaborative effort came together. That's awesome. And and I'm sure you've been, you know, from Dallas and the blues and, and all that, you've been around a lot of blues artists over the years. And I know uh, you've had some influences and I'm guessing the guy behind you there. Tell me, how did you, now you probably, you grew up what in the, uh, sixties, seventies. I was born in December 1960. So I kind of came of age in the late sixties. I mean, I was very precocious kid. I mean, I, I, I Beatles albums when I was six years old, I was very tuned. I was just, you know, that kind of kid. I read the newspaper and watched the TV news and listened to the radio, you know, in addition to the usual, Popeye and Three Stooges stuff. Sure. So I was, yeah, I was kind of hip to that at an early age. Uh, yeah. But I didn't realize, you know, there's there's a great blues tradition in Texas. And there were just, there were so many great guitar players in this area to learn from firsthand. You know, it was, uh, you, you think, you know, when you're young, you think, oh, it must be like that everywhere where it's, it's not. Right. You know, I was lucky to learn from a lot of these guys firsthand and just to, to watch them and be around them was sure. a great. Yeah. So tell me about the first moment now. I know like you, you probably grew up like everybody else loving like Leonard Skinner and people like that. But how did you really get into the real blues guitar sound and what, what made you, what got you into that? Uh, I, 
Well, I, I was into blues, and I, like I said, I, I was always interested in learning something. So I, I had a book. I believe I was already into Robert Johnson. It, I mean, this is probably right when I got out of high school. And then bought this book by Robert Robert Palmer called Deep Blues. And it just started my, you know, journey in, into this music. You know, when you first start, you, you have, I mean, I had like the Allman Brothers albums and they had songs by T-Bone Walker and Willie Cobb on there. So you start like looking into those guys and it's just, you just start going back and back. And I've always liked history of any sort. So that was a natural. And my mother's side of the family is from Mississippi in the Delta. Uh, my grandmother was a Stovall. And um, so I had that connection. But when I heard that music, it just felt it was instantly familiar. It's like something that I already knew, but had it been, had been awakened or something. I don't consider myself a blues guitarist. I'm just more of an interpreter. I'm, you know, I'm a white boy from East Dallas. <laughs> hey, I, that's, that's cool. I like that. Um, so when, when you got with these guys, I know, I know it's been so long ago since you recorded it, but uh, now tell me about recording this album though, as far as I know you said you didn't have a whole lot of time. You kind of just like, here you go. Let's do this. You brought your songs. They got their songs mm -hmm. and you kind of just came together. How did you decide really, when they were doing their thing, how did you kind of know what to play and how did you, you kind of improvise or how did that work out? Uh, well, I mean, I just, uh, the first thing I do is listen and try to find a part, a complimentary part. It's just like a conversation with several people. You know, what I say is going to be dictated by what you ask me. Right. So I, not to, and I would always try to lay back and not, not overplay, not, now find a part and play it and and not step on anybody else. It, it's I mean, it, that's really kind of the. My formula for like playing music. Sure, sure. And I guess when you're around a bunch of guys that are playing blues and really getting into it, kind of probably pumps you up and kind of inspires you to be surrounded by that. Right. Oh, yeah. I mean, Vince and Buddy are phenomenal players. Everybody involved is, you know is a one so you, you don't want to you know be the weak link right so do your best you know try to do your best work and and like i said not step on anybody's parts sure sure um so the the, the uh the new album um have you gone back and kind of listened and said you know this is pretty doggone good <laughs> and this is not too shabby have you been enjoying revisiting that time and, and really hearing how it came together, the sound sure. and everything. Yeah. Because it's, you know, once something's recorded, I, I, I don't really dwell on it. I move on unless it's something I go back and revisit to perform live. And I hadn't done it in a while. So yeah, it was like when I went back to listen, a lot of it was fresh again because I'd been away from it for so long. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know you probably with different projects that you do, I know like with monkey beat and uh, different, you know, other things you do, how does your style kind of change when you're playing with other people or does it change or do you adapt to a certain playing style? How does that work out for a different project? Um, again, it's all about listening. I, I just try to play what's appropriate. Yeah. Uh, and not try to play everything I, I know, which wouldn't take very long, but you just, just find a, a nice, simple part and play it. And I, I'm not a showboat or anything. I'm, I, I'm happy being a part of the team. That's good. That's a good way to be, right? Uh, and, you know, of, of all your influences, though, that, you know, you're, you, you love all the blues players. And, and do you take some of what they, did and kind of make it your own i guess most people do without stealing i mean i guess you could just copy you know note for note but there's got to be times though when you're playing maybe your own original stuff that you kind of hear that influence and it probably makes you smile to know you know just to think about all that you've enjoyed listening to it probably comes out in your playing you probably notice when you play right 
Yeah, it's just it's everything that I'm playing is a sum total of what I've heard. Uh, it's kind of fun to take something from one style and apply it to another. I, mean, I can't really give you an example off the top of my head. Yeah. But maybe I, I'd learned, you know, from a Ramon song or something. I just yeah. an extreme example uh, and try to apply it to, to some different style or a blues song to something that's a, you know, hard rock or high energy thing. Right. It's, well, tell us about uh, some of the songs that you, that your particular songs on the album, uh, how, what are some of the stories behind the songs? How'd you come up with the uh, titles and the everything, the lyrics and what, what really happened? What inspired you for these songs? Well, I mean, I'd rather be lucky than good is uh, looking at the songs right now. Yeah, I wrote, I had the title, I'd rather be lucky than good. Cause I, you know, it's just, it's a cliche or saying that you probably heard at some point, which is sure. a pretty common formula to write with. But um, I wrote that with Tom Hambridge, uh, Buddy Guy's drummer, he's a uh, producer and songwriter. We've worked together on several projects and I, I had that stashed away. I, I wasn't sure where I would, release it i just knew i could use it at some point so that came in handy uh trip hammer that's i just like the way that sounded you know yeah. I'm, i don't you know i can write narratives and i can write story songs but sometimes i just like the way the words sound uh because it has nothing to do with it's almost a, a, if you took the if you took the words trip hammer and put in jesus christ <laughs> <laughs> or something it would the, it would fit the lyrics more um right. if, if you if you go back and scan the lyrics um i know that's a kind of a strange answer but th that's all i got officer and <laughs> <laughs> purple mountain ask i think i probably just smoked some weed and thought that sounded cool and because like looking at a, a bottle of crown royal in, in the little purple velvet sack you know i think that's kind of probably where that came from Right. And the last song I had for the album was called Showdown. And that was sort of in the Jimi Hendrix Up From the Skies vibe. Right. And if you, you've heard that song, you'll recognize where I was right. getting my influence from probably right off the bat. Sure. That's a, that's a pretty, you know, it's hardly a unique title, but, <laughs> um, you know, is it, I'm not trying to reinvent a wheel. I'm just trying to make a good wheel. You're just trying to have fun. So, and, and, you know, it sounds like y'all had fun, you know, jamming and having a good time. I think that's what it's all about, right? And and people can tell, I think, when you're playing fits and it, it blends well and you're having fun as opposed to, like, I got to play this. <laughs> like, like it's a job. You can tell the difference. It sounds like y'all had a great time recording uh, the album. I guess that you did, right? Yeah, sure. And these guys are all friends of mine and we all laughed a lot and told a lot of jokes <laughs> yeah <laughs> fun and you know, yeah i mean that's what it's about if it's not fun then you know find something that is because then sure. people know well, they can tell you're not happy right it makes them i mean music makes people feel a certain way and especially with this kind of music with the upbeat and the, like you said you know somebody wants to li listen to Jimi hendrix or somebody or like the, the the song that you mentioned at first you know it sounds like uh CZ Top or something. I mean, mm -hmm. people want to hear that. They want to be, you know, they, they want their mood to be kind of changed from what they were. They want to want to be upbeat. Now you can have sad blues songs. You can have slower blues songs, but it also fits your mood for whatever mm -hmm. you're feeling at the time. But to be real, I guess makes a difference too. I guess whatever you're playing, do you ever do you ever get in a certain mood with your playing and you can really tell the difference in the sound? let's just say that you're maybe feeling down and out. Can you really hear that? Or do you try to do that? It's something that you kind of comes out, right? It's kind of like, I guess, singing too, you know, same way you kind of have feelings and you can really, those emotions come out, right? Yeah. I mean, it, that's probably more apparent in a live show, but I think it's, um, you know, when people are in the room with you, they can really get their pulse on like, how, you know, where you're, if you're, like I said, if you're, really feeling it and you're 
you're on like riding the crest of the wave and you're directing every I and mean, everything's just happening and rolling and unfolding perfectly. Yeah. People sense that even if sure. they're not really conscious, they can't really identify it. They know that something feels good. Yeah. And they can tell also when it's not happening. Right. You know, but if right. you're, a, you can at least put soldier through and, and make the, you know, if you're having a bad night, you can still have a good show. Right. I'm sure that's happened before. I'm sure you've had all kinds of uh, interesting uh, things happen over your years of playing, right? Are there anything, is there something uh, in your mind though, that, that stands out uh, with your playing an experience maybe that you had uh, that is an unforgettable moment. And I know like I was looking over some of the people you played with, you've had all kinds of awesome people, but you're not too shabby yourself. But what what are some of the, the moments that you've really said this is kind of unbelievable to be here playing with these guys? Oh man, I got I played you know, I opened some shows for George acoustic like solo in UK and Ireland, Ooh. and I'm a big Rory Gallagher fan, the great Irish guitar player, and I I did some of his songs in uh, Dublin and. So kind to me, they, you know, they were so nice to me um, that that was really cool. And I think the night that I met George uh, in a bar in, in Memphis, 1990, and I was playing, and he came in and saw it. That that was a magic night. Uh, Ooh. Those those two pop up. That's a pretty cool moment. Yeah. Speaking of George. So how did how did you get the gig with George? Well, Since it started at night. I was at, in Memphis at uh, Huey's uh, Midtown on Madison, and George and his band were recording about two blocks away at Ardent Studios. And they finished for the day and came in to drink and eat before they went back to the hotel. And I was playing, and we finished the first set, and I had done – a, I had done one of George's numbers. Actually, I had done Move It On Over by the great Hank Williams from Montgomery, Alabama. Right up the road here. Yeah, and I, I but I didn't know George was there when I had done it. I wouldn't have done it if I'd known that, but I'm glad. I, it, it, anyway, it worked out in hindsight. So I went over and said hello, and the set, he started moving closer and closer to the stage, and finally was standing like six feet in front of me. And, you know, I, I was probably, I was still in my 20s then. And, you know, George is a big rock star. So that like really motivated me. And then at the end of the set, he said, man, my producer, Terry Manning would love you guys. I'm going to tell him about you. And he mentioned some things I had done during the course of the set that let me know that he was truly paying attention. I did a, a, a Buddy Holly song called Not Fade Away, but I stuck yeah. in, I stuck the lick from Please Please Me from the Beatles into it. And he thought that was pretty cool. In fact, he still mentions that to me. Um, that is but cool. long story short, like fast forward several years, he did get me hooked up. I got hooked up with his producer. We did some records. I went out and toured and opened for them. Fast forward to late 1998. And they called and asked me if I would join his second guitar player. And I said, yeah, I'd love to. So since 1999, I've been doing that and like doing both bands. Sure. More, more George lately. And and that's you know that's got to be you got two different bands going on is it is there a certain feeling with this band as opposed to the other I mean is it how how different are they when you're playing on stage with these two bands? Well, I, I'm I'm in a, playing in a support capacity with George. I mean, yeah. He's the it's, you know, I'm I'm there to play what he's not playing or doesn't want to play or it's not in his wheelhouse to play. And I'm, yeah, you know, I'm there to make. That's my role, so I'm there to honor that role. And in my band, it's it's all what I want to do and how I want to do it. And with that freedom comes a lot more responsibility. So, and sometimes that's great. And other times it's not. If things are hard or things you know it's aren't going well in some particular way, then it's on you. You know. Yeah. You're right. I totally get that. Um. Well, tell me. Uh, about now, I heard a story. I read a story about uh, you. You never played on stage with Steve Ray Vaughan, right? No, but you did. You met him a few times, right? Yes. 
and, and was there a story about you, you gave him a watch or something or something happened like that? Or how did that? My, my dad owned a jewelry shop in Dallas called Lakewood Jewelers for like 45 years. And in 1989, in the summer of 89, I was happened to be in the shop that day and Stevie Ray Vaughn, who was living in Dallas then came in, he had this antique watch, came in to get it repaired. Uh, I mean, I walked right past him. I was leaving the store. I didn't even look to see who my dad was waiting on. And my dad said, Hey son, there's somebody here you might want to meet. And so you know, once I realized who it was, I went back over and we talked and he and my dad talked about, we had, we were related to some Vaughn's from Oak Cliff, which is a section of Dallas, and even a Jim Vaughn, who was Stevie's dad, big Jim. Uh, much to my disappointment, I, after a while, I learned we were not related. Uh, my dad asked him, do you have any advice for my son? And he said, yeah, keep it clean. He was into his recovery at that point. So he never comes back to get the watch, probably as a result of these ridiculous conversations we were having <laughs> but a year later he was playing in dallas's final show and i guess it was june of 1990 and i went out it was the local shed amphitheater i went out there and got backstage and took his watch back to him and we talked again then and, uh, two months later he he had passed away wow that's i mean that you know, I know things happen for reasons, and uh, but that's a really cool moment to experience with a, somebody that you admire, you know, to and for him to say that. I guess that advice kind of sticks with you for a, a well, while. I was kind of mortified when my dad asked him that at the time because I, yeah, you know, I, I, you know, I was still trying. You know, I could play, but I was still trying to get it together, you know, and. um but, you know, he was he was super sweet and kind and very patient. And, and, the, and that when I took his watch back to him, he walked up with with Tommy Shannon. And he was wearing his stage clothes and he had a, he had a, a, a glow, an aura. And I've, I've told I've told this story a lot and it's I'm not touchy feely crystals and but I believe in things I can't see. And he had a, he had an energy. He, he was radiant. He, I mean, he had something and it touches people to this day. And I'm here to tell you, I saw it in person. Um, and he played his ass off that night. He played, uh, he jammed with BB King. He insisted that BB close the show out of respect, even though we were in his Stevie's hometown. But yeah, so I probably played probably eight or 10 times. Wow. Um, uh, he definitely had an energy. You could definitely hear it. I never saw him play, but I wish I would have, but, uh, but hearing it, there's something special that's like no other. I mean, you can't really copy that. I mean, that's really amazing stuff. Um, but as you're playing, you know, for you, um, what do you think makes a, just a great solo or a, what, what makes a great solo part or in your mind i mean what it doesn't have to be so special you know to a degree but what makes it stand out do you think in your mind i don't know to me some of my favorite solos are the most shortest and most concise solos i, I you know i need to hear a lot of stuff and i do like that at, at times but like my favorite eric clapton solo is uh the song badge yes from the cream album uh, maybe it was goodbye but it's a short solo it's very lyrical it's like it's almost like another vocal part like a lot of david gilmore's solos are like that too uh it, yeah it there's just, there's a lot like that yeah I'm right words and I'm, I'm having difficulty but uh just something that's honest it's like it's that grabs people and i i can't really tell you why it what makes something that but if you can achieve that then i think you you're on to something of course right. I mean, it has to be pleasing to the air and fit the song i mean everything is there to serve the song ultimately or it should be sure and and you know 
I guess with more experience comes the knowing when to play, what not to play. And I guess you probably did that with this new album, you know, back then was like you said, sitting back, not overdoing it, not overstepping somebody. They probably did the same thing with like when you're doing your song, they're probably sitting back and trying to figure out what they want to play or how do they want to do it? Yeah. You know, and that's probably the funnest part probably with something like that is just kind of getting together and seeing what's going to happen. It's not really like it was planned, right? It's, it's kind of spontaneous, right? Yeah. And that's, that's the beauty of music. Like when you, when everybody else in the room can feel that too. I mean, it, it really is magic. Music is magic. Tom Petty said that. And he's right. Yeah, he wasn't from too, where too far from where you are. Any anyway, was right. he from Kingsville? Is that right? right, which is what a hundred or two hundred and something miles, I guess, from yeah, there. Okay. Something like yeah, that, okay. close to the Florida line. But uh, um, yeah. but that you're right. It's it's a special thing. Y'all capture it on this album. I just gotta say, it's a really good album to to jam and listen to. I mean. Uh, and that's kind of hard, uh, to come by these days. You know, a lot of people put out stuff, you know, just to be putting it out, you know, but, um, but to me, I think, uh, you know, when you got a bunch of guys that have a lot of talents and different kinds of styles, but come together kind of like, you know, an all-star form, uh, it really, it really makes a difference, you know, and, uh, I think, uh, I think people will enjoy this. What, what's been happening with the other guys? that recorded this now are y'all going to do something special for this album or what's going to happen well this saturday november 25th in fort worth texas we have a album release party at the ridgely room which is part of the ridgely theater uh and beyond that uh, we've got some dates in early 2024 here in the dallas fort worth area and we'd like to do some some uh, theater and festival dates you know, outside the area nationally or overseas in 2024. I think I'm just kind of waiting for my thorough good touring schedule to shake out for next year and then I can proceed. Um, but uh, so, let me show you this uh, inside of this album. Cool. Vance Converse. That's me. And then, um, sorry, Buddy Whittington and Jeff Simon. And then Nathaniel Peterson, the bass player, who sadly passed away a couple of months ago. Mm. Um, but it's 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 good. It's almost like a franchise because the only people that are on the album that are doing this release party this weekend are Buddy and I, and we're using my drummer and his bass player. And um, Vince is in Denver. So he, but we'll, we'll do some stuff with Vance and the three of us and Jeff Simon, the drummer from the Destroyers, right. will join some other point. It's just like geographically, we're kind of a lot of, except for Buddy and I, we're very spread out. We're in like three different times. Right. Um, but it's got to be cool to play the songs again, right? After all yeah. that time, right? We learn some of it because it's, you know, once I record something, I'll listen to it just to critique it or to mix it or whatever. But then I kind of move on. So I have to go back and relearn a lot of this stuff, which right. you know, I'm in the process of doing. <laughs> sure. It might. Yeah. I mean, it, it, that'd be an experience in itself, you know, just kind of going back and going, oh, yeah, I remember that part. Oh. Uh, mm -hmm. So what, what's been the reaction of some of the people, you know, you know maybe some of your friends and, and people like that, that you, you kind of let them hear it? What, what's what been their reaction? Were they kind of surprised and have a smile on their face to hear uh, that sound? That's a cool sound. I mean, it's a cool, it's a cool sound. Uh, it, yeah, I mean, the, feed, the feedback I've gotten has been positive. I haven't actually said, I mean, I've given some some promo CDs to some friends, but back when i was actually playing it for people i mean that was when we, right after we did it which was you know in october of 2009 um so it, it's been a minute since that happened but I, the feedback i've gotten has been positive yeah everybody likes it that's awesome um well uh i appreciate you uh talking with me today uh i'm uh i'll be promoting that music uh 
couple of singles. I think y'all y'all released a couple. I think it's on YouTube. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, everybody can check out. Where can they find out more about this album and and things like that? Well, there's not a Texas Scratch website at this moment, but uh, if you go Porto Valley Records, uh, uh, Q U A R T O Valley Records, their website or jimsuler.com. You can find out more about it. Um, here's the album. Awesome cover. Yeah. And um, while, while I'm at it, I also did a single earlier this year called Get Your Head Right. And you can download that on my website or any of the uh, any music platforms where you would normally do that. Uh, I, you know, I would encourage anybody to purchase it or stream it if you got to, you know. Sure. Great song, by the way. Uh, that oh. that one just yeah the uh, get your head right yeah I just and I just real quick Gary I just did one with sure. uh, Tyler Bryant from Nashville are you hip to him Tyler mm. Bryant takedown yeah no, he's he's a he's a badass uh, I've known him since he was twelve he's from my area cool and uh, did something with him and his lovely wife Rebecca from Larkin Poe was nice enough to sing harmonies on it also. Awesome. It's pretty killer. It's called Dusty Groove, and I'm we're gonna get, put that out um, early in 2024. Cool. So I had to throw that in there. Thank you. You you got to. It's all your stuff you got going on. Uh, yeah, man. You you got a website though, right? Yes, jimsuler dot com. J i m s u h l e r dot com. Okay. Um, and I, I guess on social media they can check you out. Social media things like that and they can look for the albums and whatever you got going on youtube's a good place to check out some of the music too and uh some great stuff man i've been checking it out i love Thank the you. new album too and uh, i hope everybody gets a chance to listen to it because it really is good and it really was worth the wait really good stuff man well thank uh, you to get down to burr someday and go to the blueberry festival there you go get <laughs> so you know about all that stuff well, i looked blueberry it up festival. oh yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> actually, they all said you were in Brewerton, and there is no Brewerton. Yeah, it's Bruton. Uh, yeah, yeah but, Bruton. Okay, yeah. Th there's there's an Italy, Texas, but everybody calls it Italy. Italy. Yeah, you yeah. got you got to have that that accent. Uh, you were talking about your family uh, from Mississippi. My uh, well, we're all from Alabama, but my granddad moved to uh, Pascagoula in Moss Point years ago so I have, I have aunts in mississippi so i'm just saying the whole delta area is my family you know that that's another thing about growing up in texas or alabama you learn to appreciate all kinds of music especially rock southern rock blues country it all kind of ties in it all comes from the same spot the blues kind of started it all and we kind of just stole everything you know, from those guys, but uh, people understand when you're from the South about music, I think more uh, because you've, you've, you've heard it all and you've been right in the middle of it. You've seen these, like you've seen these uh, classic uh, blues players and firsthand. So I know, I know you've had a, a great time listening to that, right? Oh, sure, man. It's, it's the best. It's, it's, it's the truth in three chords. It's what it is, you know? Yeah. That's awesome stuff. Well, I thank you, Jim, for chatting with me. Uh, looking forward to seeing you, you know in the future what you got going on. I have to check out. I had I missed y'all coming in this area, George. In the you know, yeah. I mean, come on, that's good stuff, man. Uh, but uh, maybe I'll get to check you out somewhere someday. Yes, and send send me a message, and and I'll I'll hook you up, man. I'll get you some tickets. I I sure will do that, Jim. Right on. Thanks a lot. Well, you have a, a great afternoon, whatever's left of it. And yeah, uh, we'll talk to you later. Okay, Gary. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving to you. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to another episode, everybody. Happy Thanksgiving once again. Hope you had a great day. And uh, check out Jim Suler's website for more information and all his social media pages. And check out the new album, Texas Scratch. Until next time, everybody, always remember to keep the music real.